Um, a huge thank you to Tile Bar all around us for hosting us tonight. Um, I am a huge fan, Street is a huge fan, and I've used the tile in my own home, so thumbs up, great source if you guys are looking. Um, so quickly, the purpose of tonight's event. We at Street Easy um, have heard a lot from our customers about excitement about renovating, fear about renovating, wanting to buy a home that probably needs renovating. Oh shit, I have a home that needs renovating and I didn't realize that. So we wanted to put together an event um, and you'll see if you follow Street Easy content in days and months to come to give you some tips, tricks, kind of unlock some of the mysteries and scaries around renovating. Um, and wanted to bring some really talented partners that we have at Street Easy on board to help do that for you. Um, quickly about myself, my name is Amory Wooden. I head up marketing at Street Easy um, by day, and by night I am a mom in Brooklyn to three little guys, and um, my husband and I renovate homes. Um, and so we are about to start our fifth brownstone project and are crazy and tired and stressed, but really love it at the same time. So I'll weave in a few personal anecdotes along the way. So the first thing we're going to talk about are the nuts and bolts of renovation. Uh -huh. um, team, budget, timeline, all of the things that um, are really the biggest things to talk about. So want to invite up Adam and the Brownstone boys on stage. All right, so um, we have Jordan and Barry from the Brownstone Boys. I don't know if any of you follow them on Instagram. You should if you do not. Um, many of us have come to love and follow the project that they've embarked on, um, renovating by hand over a 100-year-old brownstone in Brooklyn, um, and are now acting as project managers for many other projects as well. So welcome, guys. Thank you. And then I have Adam Dayhill from Citizens Bank, who has a ton of experience in lending, um, specifically in a product called a construction loan that you guys will hear more about tonight. And Adam um, is also an experienced developer doing Brownstone Brooklyn renovation. This was not planned, but after this event, if anyone wants to talk about Brooklyn Brownstones, um, specifically in bed -Stuy, <laughs> talk to any of the four of us. So that is where we're going to start. Thank you. Uh, and I need my slide clicker. It's right here. Thank you. All right. So uh, very quickly, the well, I would love for you guys all to be paying attention. If you need to check your phones, the service isn't great down here. So Wi-Fi password, if you need it, is right here. All right. So the nuts and bolts of renovating. Before we start, who here has renovated? Great. Who here owns a home currently that they would like to renovate? Great. Who here is looking for a home that they hope to renovate? Or looking for a home with a problem that they would like to fix themselves? <laughs> um, who here thinks it's probably going to be really, really fun and easy to renovate? <laughs> cool. Okay, cool. That's why we're here, right? Fine. Good idea. Awesome. So uh, on Instagram these days, that's where I get all my inspiration, all of these renovated homes look so beautiful and perfect, and I think we all know what we want the end product to look like. That, right? Um, the biggest question we hear is, where do I start? How do I even think about this? Who do I call? So wanted to ask you guys, like, where should all these people start in the process? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And we actually hear that question probably more than any other. People that reach out to us online or through our blog or on Instagram ask, you know, I, I just bought a place. I've been reaching out to general contractors and architects. No one's getting back to me. I don't know what to do. Uh, I don't know where to turn. Um, and that, it's really common. So um, it, it is tough. And the, the first thing that we always recommend is to get an idea of the process, which you guys are doing here tonight, which is awesome. So learn the process, kind of understand who the players are and who you're, who the, who, what the members of the team need to be, and then start finding that team. That's kind of, that's kind of the tough part. Um, and we usually recommend, you know, find, find a great architect, uh, first and foremost. That's usually where we start. Um, and find a good GC, find a good general contractor, 
And th then the other players will kind of fall in place. But it is, it is kind of a tougher question, and I'm sure we'll yeah. talk more about that as we go through. Awesome. So when we think about team, um, there are kind of five folks that people hear about and would love for you guys to walk through the role of the architect versus the GC versus the PM um, and what they all do so people can think about how they would form their own team. Yeah, for sure. So um, I, I guess, yeah, there's, there's five players that you're gonna, you're gonna deal with. The, the architect, the general contractor, um, you probably will have some specialists as well that will come in. We were just talking about how the GC is not going to do everything. There's going to be things that they're probably not going to do, especially if it's a restoration like a lot of us have been involved in. Um, so you might need some specialists, uh, a project manager uh, and or an interior designer um, could be involved too. So not always. You may manage your own projects. You may do all your own interior designs. That's, that's fine as well. Um, but you may also need some assistance along the way, so know you'll have those players. But you'll definitely have a, a, a contractor and definitely an architect. The architect is gonna be the person who um, you're gonna tell all your hopes and dreams to, how you want the space configured, you know, how you wanna live in it. Uh, they will put together some proposed drawings. Uh, they'll do a design review with you. They'll walk you through that. You'll probably go through th some revisions. They will make sure everything is up to DOB code, uh, Department of Buildings code. Um, they'll make sure that, um, that everything is drawn the way it needs to be and filed the way it needs to be with the DOB. So that, that's where, the, where they fall in. So one, one common question on that is I think a lot of people are curious the difference between an architect, a licensed architect, and a designer. Um, do you want to jump on this one, Adam? Well, architect will draw plans, file those plans. They know code. Designers are... You have a design architect, you could also have a filing architect. So it depends what facet of the job they are doing. They can do all of it, they can do just do some. Sometimes an architect will work with a designer and they will, the designer will basically detail what they want to see in vision and the architect will draw it up and make sure it fits the boxes it needs to fit, so to speak, with DOB, LPC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so really let's depends. dig into that. Who knows what LPC is? There you go. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about permits, and let's talk about LPC and DOB, some of those scary words. Who wants to, <laughs> you guys want to talk about permits. <laughs> We've talked about our, our different confidence levels in needing permits, and yeah. <laughs> I For think sure. you guys so, are a good one. So when you get your, your permits, you know, the, the, the architect will look at what is currently on file for the building, especially if it's a restoration or a brownstone like we're all used to doing. Um, and then based on what you want to do, there's different ways that you'll, you could potentially have to file with the DOB. So if it's a two family and you want to make it a one family, or if the configuration is a certain way, you want to change that, um, it's a little bit more involved. So the architects will figure out exactly what needs to be done to file with the DOB and, and to get those approvals. Um, the next thing that has to happen is those, those permits. The, once the approvals are done, the, the general contractor will pull the permits. Um, so that they can start the work. Uh, we hear all the time from people who are trying to buy a place that there was unpermitted work and there's a stop work order and it's just a really big mess to clean all that up. So um, we have people that reach out to us and ask if they really need an architect. Um, and you do, you need, a, you, you need to follow the DOB, you need an architect, you definitely don't want to, especially I think it's gotten, um, th there's been a lot more cracking down with stuff like that in New York too in the last mm -hmm. few years. So it's definitely not something you wanna mess around with. So, the architect's going to get the approved plans done, the GC is going to pull the permits, and that way, you know, everything is good to go. That's great. Um, and so how would folks find people like this? How do you find talented people who you can trust? Um, where do you start looking for those, these types of partners? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question. And I, I would say what, what we have done is we've met a lot of people along the way. So, you know, we've been managing projects, and the project manager what can bring in the team for you as well. So if you do have a project manager that's going to sort of coordinate everything for you, they can recommend different team members and they can bring the team in. Um, other than that, I would ask around, ask people that you know who've done renovations. It's basically that, shopping around. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're shopping around, you're, you're gonna interview a lot of people um, and, the, and people that you know that, that have been through the process and understand how the person works is gonna be the, the best way to get a recommendation. So uh, other than that, uh, forums like on StreetEasy, on Brownstoner, if you read the, that 
blog uh, are really, really helpful. You'll find recommendations there. Um, as well, and I think that's probably where we found a lot yep. of not only our GCs that we've worked with, but the specialists we brought in too. Yeah, our specialists were definitely uh, the fun part of the renovation. Uh, wood stripping, uh, plaster work, it's all um, different forums available for, we spend hours, I think five to 10 hours a week just searching on the forums itself. Yeah, just finding the right person, interviewing them, um, and they're some of the biggest characters too that yeah. we've had come <laughs> in. Very much so, especially in Brooklyn or Queens. Yes. Need some yeah. big characters. I think it's important to kind of decide on your scope of work. That's gonna really detail what you need to accomplish and how in depth you have to file. If you need to file, I'm not saying don't file, but if you're doing a cosmetic kind of facelift of an interior and nothing is moving, you can probably get away with doing less of the intense filing paperwork. But if you're moving wet spaces, if you're changing the use and occupancy of the building, if you're expanding it, I highly recommend you have a solid team put together. This is not, you know, plaster work. You know, you can do your floors over without a permit. You can do plaster work. You can resurface kitchen cabinets. You can do tile work, all without pulling an alteration to permit. But if you're gonna get more involved, highly, highly recommend getting a solid team together and have it all kind of planned and specced out before you start work. A lot of times you'll get in trouble with, we'll figure it out on the way and it just causes more delays down the line. Yeah. And so I actually think that's a great transition into the timeline, which is, you know, you hear about, you know, I have friends who you hear about these stories where people spend two years on a gut renovation and then I hear about people like flipping a bathroom in a day, which I, I don't. <laughs> I don't, that doesn't actually happen, so that's not real. Uh, you know, what, is, what are some of the ranges of timelines that you can see for a project? So let's, let's skip a full gut for the moment because that's something special. Let's talk about like a kitchen versus, and redoing a kitchen with moving plumbing versus like just kind of facelifting a bathroom, maybe leaving everything where it is, putting some new beautiful tile bar tile in mm -hmm. um, and a new shower curtain like what does that look at f look like from a different um, timeline perspective yeah so the light reno just give facelift stuff was something that maybe maybe doesn't need to be filed like Adam was talking about uh, a couple of months maybe you know th two or three months so it can go pretty quick I mean you're not waiting around for your approvals you're probably in that case not having an architect involved so it can go pretty pretty quick um, to the the full gut like the other side of it you know, could be over a year. Um, the two-year projects, I mean, they probably had some problems. They didn't manage it right. They didn't order they, what they needed to. They had some trouble with, you know, landmarks. Uh, Landmark loses whatever. the file. Yeah, loses the file like they with you. Expediter didn't file something correctly. It happens from time to time. It's always better to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Yeah. Uh, and I use all these uh, analogies at time, trying to don't spend a don't spend a dollar to try to save fifty cents. So do the right way the first time and you'll save money in the long run. And so can you guys talk a little bit about the permits process? Both of you guys have done homes which have required permits. What does that look like? Um, and who files permits? Can I file a permit, file for a permit? How does that process work? What happens and what would happen if you didn't get a permit and you got caught? Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> I uh, like to follow rules, yeah, no. <laughs> so I get permits, but some people don't. So I want to just walk you guys through what that looks like. For sure. So um, I, I would say the, the whole process would, I, I think, should take two to three months. I mean, I think it could take longer than that, but I think that ideally is you're doing well if it's in two or three months. A lot of it is not necessarily waiting for the permit and waiting for the approval. It's just actually going through that design phase, you know, meeting with your architect, deciding how you want to lay out the plans, kind of going through a few revisions of that. Um, then, then filing with the, the DOB, they're, pro they're going to send back a whole lot of objections, you know, probably a couple of pages of them, nothing to be concerned about. It's totally normal. It happens every time. And then you go through and the architect will, will, re will revise that. So I think it should take about two or three months. Mm -hmm. Could be a little bit longer if there is a landmarks approval that you have to go through, and, and then that depends on how large in scope that is. Um, but uh, the, the architect will file. There's sometimes an expediter involved as well in the filing. Um, we actually work with an architect that goes to the DOB and does the filing himself, which I think is awesome because he's there to actually have a conversation with the plan examiner who's going to you know, yep. go through that process with him. Um, but there are sometimes there's a person called an expediter that will facilitate the actual filing. 
Yep. Um, and so in, in my experience, I've used both an architect who acts as an expediter and then a licensed architect who has a separate expediter. So an expediter's role um, is, sorry, I'll back up. An architect's role, a licensed architect's role, is to draw up all the plans, um, sign off on them, they have their license and their reputation on the line, put the plans forth and get them ready to submit for the landmarks or the Department of Buildings to approve them or work with them to eventually get them approved. Um, that's the architect's scope. What then happens after they get them ready is they have to go through a pretty complicated process with the Department of Buildings in the city. Um, if any of you have ever gone to get any sort of city issued license of any format um, down at City Hall or in Brooklyn, you might have a sense of what this is like. So you take that and then you add um, the buildings department, many of kind of the paperwork and the history of the buildings, which is what the DOB needs to look up. Those are paper files sometimes stored in New Jersey. So you start to weave this process and what an expediter does is they spend almost every day at the DOB. They know the people, they know the processes. Um, there's no like, cheating, beg borrowing or stealing, anything like that. They just know how to get the paperwork through the system um, and they know how to talk to the right people. They knew which plan examiner is gonna be harder, they knew which one's going to be easier um, and they just bring you through the process. So there are, expedite, there are real estate agents who are also expediters. There are larger architecture offices have an expediter in house um, and there are also architects who act as expediters as well. I would highly recommend um, if you are getting into a project where you require permits, where you're submitting to the city, that you have an expediter involved, it just helps make things go a lot more smoothly. Um, if not, you can go down to the DOB yourself. <laughs> it's a really challenging experience. I've tried it's it once or twice. Yeah, <laughs> I it's... kind of liken it to, if you've never been to DOB, it's kind of like the DMV at times. With lots of lines, of and you're waiting for your number, and then did I miss my number? And, and then, then you're on the wrong asking floor. Asking somebody, and then, oh, you're on that room, and you run down. It's surprisingly archaic and Byzantine is the best yes. way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but it makes for sometimes you sit, take a step back and look at yourself and like, I can't believe I'm doing this. But. Well, and then sometimes you take a, type, take a step back and you're mm -hmm. like, right, well, I'm looking to renovate a, a home that's connected to 40 other homes that's connected to another building down a block. So it is important that's that we all much. follow rules. We keep structures standing and keep the integrity of the projects in place. Um, so that's just a little bit on permits and expediting. And I forgot to add, there will be questions at the very end of this, so please jot down and save your questions for the end, if interested. Um, construction, would love for you guys just to talk quickly about the phases of construction. I know that's your favorite part of the project, um, and would love to bring that to everybody here. Yeah, for sure. So the, the first thing that happens is uh, obviously once the GC gets those permits in hand, you can actually start working. Before that, it is pretty frustrating because you have, you just bought your place, it's a mess, you wanna start tearing the walls down and, and get to work, but you're, you're in that kind of two to three month waiting period. Um, paying so a mortgage payment for three months and mortgage nothing's happening while you're paying rent somewhere else or yep. two mortgages, so yep. yeah, it's, it's fun. So it gets a little frustrating, <laughs> but once, once you have those permits in hands, uh, the, your GC can go in and start demo. So it's the first thing that's gonna happen. Um, get everything torn out that needs to come out. He'll start, you know, building things back in, uh, plumbing, electrical. Uh, you know, start with the finishes and get the walls closed up. There, there, there are a couple of uh, inspections that have to happen during the middle of the process. Your GC will coordinate that. Um, but I, I would say typically the construction phase, it's gonna be the longest part. It's gonna be where all your money is spent. It's gonna be where a lot of the surprises come up. Um, which, which is always fun. So, uh, but it, it, we, we usually recommend on most of the projects that we work with uh, in between like six and 12 months for the construction phase. Depending on the scale. Yeah, between the scope for sure. It could, could be shorter than that as well if yeah. it's a smaller project. But. And so talk a little bit about living in a home during construction, not living in a home during construction, what people should consider and expect. Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a very important thing. You know, it depends if you're renovating an older home that's you know, built, you know, in the late 1800s possibly. You could have asbestos, you could have lead paint, you have small children in your house. There's a lot of things you gotta prepare for uh, when doing so. You know, part of the 
process of getting your permits is an asbestos test. Mm -hmm. So usually that will be remediated before any demo is really done. So you're protected on that front. But like lead paint, it's everywhere. You sign a lead paint writer when you rent an apartment in New York City. It was built prior to what, 1973, I believe? 78. So those are things to consider. And I'll, dust is going to get everywhere. And yeah. everything, you can't imagine where it's going to get. You're going to clean, it's going to be dirty by the time you finish the room. Air conditioning vents. Air, yeah. No one ever thinks of the air conditioning it's, vents. It's really, yeah, and then Let's your AC see. goes out because you have plaster dust in there and everything. So I highly recommend um, not living in the house, if at all possible. Of course, if you're doing a bathroom, you're living on one floor and doing something else, but a full gut's going to be difficult at best. The other thing that I would recommend, too, is just when it comes to the timeline, is if you are able to get yourself in a different living situation, so you're not living during the reno, make sure that you don't set an end date on that right when you feel like you're probably going to finish renovation, because you probably won't, and that's going to create a really stressful situation if you know your, your time is up in whatever place you're running temporarily, and the renovation is probably not going to be finished on time. Um, so I would, I would probably extend that a little further out, even, even if everything goes perfectly and you finish and you can move quicker, you may have spent a little bit of extra money, it's worth it just in case you don't. Yep. And so on the time topic, how much time should us as homeowners, as kind of the client on the project, how much time do we need to commit to the project? How much time do we need to be prepared to take away from parenting, personal life, professional life, all those sorts of things. I think it's important to spend a, a good amount of time if you want to have your vision come to fruition. You know, there's depends on how much money you have. If you hire a Cracker Jack team that is like, you know, top of the list design, architect, et cetera, and you just basically hand the keys over to them with a blank check and just build it for me the way you want to, great. But if you want to have your own personal stamp on something, you need to be involved. You need, especially if you're doing small detail work where a contractor or a subcontractor says, that looks fine. And you know, myself, my, my personality, I'm a little bit of OCD and I'll, I'll be like, are you insane? How do you believe this is okay or acceptable? So you have to kind of, I want to say micromanage, but showing up unannounced is a good Check thing in. to keep your people uh, uh, on, you know, on time and doing the right job. I know people that actually will like buy a place in Brooklyn or living in Manhattan and will move to the area that they're renovating in a rental just so they can be closer to the house so they're not you know, working a you know, eight, nine, 10 hour day sometimes in our careers and then have to schlep out to Brooklyn just to keep an eye on things and go back to their, the rental in uh, the city or their apartment in the city. So uh, it's a good thing to keep you know, tabs on things. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people get a GC and say, okay, I have a GC, they're gonna manage everything for me. But there's a lot of managing of the GC and everyone else involved as well. A lot of coordination has to be done. I would say we spent maybe five hours to 15 hours a week. 20. Probably 20 yeah. sometimes. <laughs> uh, I mean, sourcing your finishes and, you know, you'll spend hours and hours doing that, you know, finding the team, you know, meeting with the, the general contractor, seeing something done wrong and having them redo it. There, there's a good amount of management that has to be done. And I think a, on a good week, five hours is pretty good. And a lot of weeks, 20 hours as well. So there's a lot of time out of your schedule and your, you know, if you have a demanding work schedule or family schedule, it can be kind of tough. Yeah. And one thing that I learned along the way was um, I, I have a certain vision in my head and I may not be really clear about that with my contractor. And mm -hmm. so I think that there's kind of, uh, there's an assumption that the contractor is gonna do like a crappy job or the easiest job or the simplest thing and they aren't gonna do their best. Truthfully, everyone has their own point of view and what looks great to me may not be what looks great to Adam, isn't what looks great to my contractor. And so, um, and I'm not a professional interior designer who can, who can communicate my vision really clearly. So being on site, seeing the work that's being done and being able to very quickly pivot and say, oh no, 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 like I wanted my tile to be closer together. Like I wouldn't have thought ahead to say, I want grout lines that are one eighth of an inch, but when I see the tiles there, I say, oh no, like, um, and so that's just something to keep in mind is that I, I think the team that you hire, they are your team. Like they're gonna be with you the whole time. Have, like assume that they have the best intentions in mind and assume that they're gonna try and make you happy, but you need to tell them what's going to make you happy and what, what you Not need to readers, do. Not mind readers, right? You have to yeah. make sure, and the more often you check on the project, you can nip it in the bud if it's going the wrong way. 
yep. starting to go sideways, you can fix it now. Once the walls are closed up and it's painted and you're like, well, who's going to pay for to correct it? That's very expensive yep. if you miss a mistake. Yeah, that comes back to bite you in the back end. Um, and so I'm assuming that people here don't have like just millions of dollars in their bank account ready to pay for a renovation. If you do, let us know. We'll Finance my next Help us, yeah. Let's team up. Um, so <laughs> paying for a renovation, um, that's like a very real thing that is, has been stressful for me, is stressful for so many people, and um, really thrilled Adam's here to talk a little bit about all the different ways that you could pay for your renovation. So you don't just have to have $100,000 in your bank account in cash. Um, that is great if you do. Um, but if you don't, there are a lot of different options that, that you have at your disposal. Um, and I'll actually plug very quickly Citizens Bank. Um, there are really only two banks right now that have construction loans um, and offer those as a product. It's a pretty unique product. And Citizens is one of them. Adam's an amazing lender. TD Bank is another one. Um, and so I just wanted to call that out. So if coming out of this event, you go to your um, mortgage lender at Chase, at Wells, at you know any of the normal guys and say, I want a construction loan. They're not going to have it for you. There's nothing wrong with them. That's just not an offering from a traditional bank. So wanted to add that caveat up front. But yeah, Adam, would love to hear a little bit about the options that people have for paying for their renovation, whether they already own the home they're going to renovate or whether they're looking to buy a place that they're going to renovate. And it looked like we have a mixed audience at the beginning. Well, thank you for the introduction. I think it's important to determine exactly what your transaction is. Do you already own a property that you're looking to borrow against and renovate? Or are you, or are you doing a purchase and renovation loan, which we do at the bank. It's a one close where you can actually get money to buy the house and the money to fix it up. So really, it's two different you know, scenarios, so to speak. Uh, at times, you will need a purchase and renovation loan if you're buying a property that is not habitable. You know, a bank won't let you get a mortgage today if the house is not fully complete. You know, we call it appraisable. If you were buying a shell property, if you're going to Brownstone, Brooklyn, Uptown, we're all over New York City. There, I closed a transaction recently where they started gutting their house and they realized they didn't want to do it and they sold it. Prime Upper East Side, $5 million house, but unappraisable, unable to get financing because it was not ready to move in. You need to have an operating kitchen. There cannot be any health or safety hazards. So my clients had to come to me. They went to their local bank. They said no. They referred to me, and we closed on the transaction. So it's dependent on the property, and it depends on the price point. You know, the, the more expensive property gets, banks tend to scale back on the leverage. So if you're buying something for a million, or a million five, or two million, you may be able to get 80% of your total project cost, which is nice. You start going up to the three, four, five, six million dollars range, the banks are going to want to see a little more skin in the game. You may be at 70% financing or even 65%. So it really depends where you fall on that spectrum. Um, the complicated issue when you're doing a purchase and acquisition is how fast can you get your team together? You know, you may already envision you're going to buy a renovation, uh, pro a house that needs renovation. So you already have an architect and a GC put together. Uh, you already vetted them, you already interviewed them, you know your team is, so you can execute quickly on it. Because most sellers are not gonna want to wait around for you to interview all these GCs, think, you know, coming in and out of the house multiple times for a property that you don't own. Yeah. So it really depends on the transaction and how you know, flexible all parties are. So I think, I would assume most people here are familiar with the traditional mortgage process. For a construction loan, whether it's um, a purchase and construction loan or an individual construction loan, what's kind of that checklist of things Bare that the person needs yeah. to submit? So and I need... ask because I'm going through <laughs> it right now. It's really long, so take notes. So it's very important because part of the mortgage process is getting the property appraised. But if you're doing a renovation or construction loan, the, the appraiser actually needs to review those specific documents. So they can't even appraise the property until they have that. And they're going to need First generation plans, floor plans with dimensions, and if you're doing an expansion, they're going to see elevations as well. Uh, they don't need to be approved plans. You know, we're not the DOB, but you know, the bank needs to know: Are you moving walls? Where are things going? Are they staying the same? Uh, we're going to need to see specs. Specs are basically what the plans call out for. You know, what kind of sheetrock? What kind of cabinets? What kind of stone? What kind of X, Y, Z? Uh, we're going to need to see a 
contract with your GC or builder and a line item budget. So you need to know how much you're going to spend, where that money is being allocated to, and how is it all going to fit together. And then you develop what's called a draw schedule. Uh, the draw schedule can happen during your mortgage process. It tweaks up until the final end result, but you'll need to have that budget, specs, and floor plans at the bare minimum to move the, the dial, so to speak, okay. get approved. And then the loan is based on well, is um, it the home value, or is it the work a, that you're planning on? On a doing? purchase, acquisition, renovation loan, one close, it's going to be a loan to costs as opposed to a, a house you already own, we're going to base your scenario off the future value. Mm. The future value is very important on the purchase loan as well because they want to make sure you're not over-improving for the area. If every house in your neighborhood sells for $2 million and you're building a $3.5 million house, the bank is going to have issue with it. and They're not going to let you do it or they're not going to finance it. Um, so. At times, it really depends on where you're building. If you're in landmarks, I've had actually had clients that would buy a property with a higher leverage loan, interest only, so they can just get the property and then spend six months developing their plan, filing for it, because they want to start with a construction loan once they have everything in place. Um, but that's basically it. You know, you really need to have an idea of what you're going to build and how much it's going to cost. Great. And then if somebody already owns their home, so if there are some homeowners in here who have had their home for a while and they're now, you know, thinking it might be time to move to the next phase and renovate, what are options other than construction loans that people could consider? If you have a lot of equity in your property, there's two things you can do. You don't need to involve a construction loan if you don't have to. And honestly, I would recommend you don't because you're involving a third party that's going to manage an oversight. Sometimes you may want to be able to do things your way, take your time on it without this kind of exploding you know, a clock that's got a counting down that you have one year to build or a year and a half to build. If you have a lot of equity, you could do two things. If your interest rate is not fantastic right now uh, or you're afraid of anything adjustable, you can refinance with cash out. You can get a 30-year fix. Interest rates are back down uh, pretty low again. Uh, but let's just say you have a, a loan in place that's an amazing rate. You do not want to touch it. You have a 3% 30-year fix and you never want to touch that rate. You can get a home equity line of credit. It's a second line of credit that's basically attached to your property, and you only pay interest on the money you use. And we do that as well at Citizens Bank, where, let's just say, argument's sake, you have a property that's worth $2 million today, and you owe a million on your first mortgage. The bank will let you borrow probably up to 80 to 90% of the combined value. So you can borrow on a line of credit $800,000, so to speak, and then use that to build your house at your own timeline. And essentially you can you know, kind of phase it out to the point where you're not overspending it in the moment. Awesome. And, you know, a lot of credits have a, uh, the, you know, the, they're adjustable, so, and you have a 10-year you know, draw period, and after that you have to pay it off. Many times I will see somebody take out a line of credit, at, do the renovation, and then realize that they're paying you know, 5% at 800000 and maybe 3% for a million, and they may want to fold them both together in the future and combine them, which we'll do as well, and the blending rate might be better than the, uh, the two loans separate. You know, there's no set, you know, all fits one box, so to yeah. speak. Awesome. Um, great. So it, that's great. I mean, I hope that you guys take away. There are options. There are different ways of looking at things. Um, feel free to reach out to the lender you have currently, to somebody like Adam, um, all of those things, and really learn what your options are. Um, so wrapping up this panel quickly, I have a question for everybody. What was the biggest mistake you made on one of your renovation projects? Oh, wow. This is a surprise. Uh, we didn't talk didn't about this in advance. <laughs> it's like an interview question. We don't, what are yeah. your flaws? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that and, and I, it's funny because we talk about this all the time with people and making sure that this doesn't happen, but we had several situations with our personal renovation project where we didn't order enough stuff or, you know, it just slows everything down and there's no reason for it. So I think that that's probably, we've yeah. had, you know, th there's been some timeline extensions that we could have avoided. Um, and I guess you should plan on having them no matter what, because if it's not this, it's probably something else. Uh, but I would say, you know, there's been a few timeline extensions and, and ordering not enough materials has been the reason <laughs> a few times. I would say going with the lowest bidder is my, my mistake sometimes. When you're bidding out a job and 
you have a subcontractor and there's three bids and two are here and one is here, there's a reason why that one is here and it usually will come back to bite you in the, the backside. And you, they'll either not finish the job, do the job, um, not to the standard you're looking for, uh, or just take entirely too long. So. Awesome. Well, thank you guys very thank much. You. We you. appreciate it. Thanks, guys. So we're gonna do we're gonna do the other panel and then bring everybody up to do questions at the same time. If that's okay. So hold them. Awesome. Um, all right, so for our next panel, we are going to talk about high value projects and designing for the long term. So hopefully you guys got some information about um, the nuts and bolts, the team, the timeline, the budget, um, all of those really critical things. I love the design portion of it. So bringing up some friends who are very talented, um, Natasha Haberman and Jason Saft. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Natasha is an interior designer and has her own studio, Natasha Haberman Studio. And Jason is a real estate agent for Compass and home stager in the city. He has his own business called Stage to Sell um, and both have wonderful Instagram personalities and presences. So I encourage you to follow them. I'm plugging all over the place. Yes. It wasn't my intention all at all, but I am a marketer. So <laughs> here we are. Um, so thank you guys for joining us. Great Very to excited here. to have you here. Um, so what I wanted to start with, with you guys, is really thinking about um, what, what people can do and what they can invest money in that they can get that money back. Because I think, like, we just talked about how, how you need to find this money, and I think most New Yorkers, as they're thinking about pouring money into their home, yes, they want to live there, but they also want to make sure that down the road, they can get that money back if they sell, if they rent, um, whatever it may be. So um, the first thing I wanted to ask is really about kind of the value of projects and what types of projects are the most expensive and have kind of the highest value in the home and what are the, the least expensive types of renovation projects? Wanna go? Sure. Okay. Um, so often most of the expensive are when you're structurally changing anything, uh, moving lines and you're doing the kitchens, the bathrooms, the floors, uh, the walls. The least expensive are obviously sort of like the decorative, well, not always. The, the decorative flourishes sometimes can be often incredibly expensive, but you do start to find how to toe the line on where you want to put your budget and where you don't want to put your budget. And I think that's one of the most important things is sort of stepping back from everything and understanding what do you actually need to be comfortable? What lessons have you learned in your previous home? What do you want to change? Um, because again, we do get very caught up and captivated in this sort of like, everything looks visually stunning, mm -hmm. um, it may not be attainable, it may not be necessary, and it may not be the most important. Um, so the first thing I always do with any project is really start a checklist of the things that are absolutely critical and necessary, and start to understand what those costs can be, because for each project you can do new floors very inexpensively, or you can spend a lot on them. Um, and I think you also have to start to understand, you know, which parts you want to put the budget to, where you want to cut back a little bit, um, and a lot of that should come from your own functionality, comfort, the comfort of your family, um, because again, some people will have sort of this perception, like you have to spend ten to $20,000 on a stove, we were joking about it earlier, and you don't. Those it's red knobs. It's people great, really love um, but you knobs. don't always have to spend ten to $20,000 on a stove, especially if you don't cook. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really amazing how many times you, you go, again, as this, this role of a real estate agent who's also designing properties, um, you often go into a property that's five, six, seven years old and no one's used that stove. It's like, to me, that's a waste of money at times um, because the person coming in, sometimes they look at it as a five, six, seven year old renovation and in our world, five, six, seven years is now completely yeah. dated. Um, so <laughs> it's nuts, um, but you know, so that's, I think, how you have to sort of look at it, or what's most important to you, and where should you put your money, and then from there, start to really sort of itemize it and research where each one can be more cost-effective and where you should splurge. 
And so when, if we're talking about the expensive projects, which are kitchens and bathrooms, right? Um, if you're doing an overhaul, what makes those expensive? Why, why is that a big project for somebody? I mean, it's really down to the finishes is where you can get carried away. I mean, we can get countertops that aren't that expensive, and then you can get countertops that are $300 a square foot. So I think what's important is figuring out what, is, you know, what your property value is and balancing, um, picking the right material within a budget. So you, know, you want to say, I can spend this much per square foot, and these are the materials that look really nice and our buyers are going to like. Um, you know, things like backsplashes and cabinetry can be, you know, you can get Ikea cabinetry and it's actually not that expensive. Um, you can make it m more expensive looking by adding custom fronts to it, which is a lot of people are doing now. Um, but it's really those bigger items, cabinetry, countertops, backsplashes, no lighting you can do inexpensively flooring inexpensively, um, appliances you can do inexpensively, look at uh, resale shops, look on Craigslist, look um, secondhand. People are constantly renovating in New York City and saying, like Jason said, oh, this was renovated five years ago, this beautiful fridge that was never used, but I don't want to use it because it doesn't fit in my new floor plan or footprint. Um, so those things you can really get a bargain on. It's just picking your price point and doing it correctly. Got it. And so if people um, aren't ready to do a major overhaul, they aren't ready to move plumbing, they aren't, they just want to start smaller, what are some smaller things that you can do to kind of give your home or apartment a facelift? And that may also be if there are people here who are currently renting before they go to buy the new home, what are some nice things that you can do to kind of lighten the space up or make it feel different without doing a, a big investment in them. They have a long list. I, yeah, I love <laughs> the cosmetic stuff. Um, just curious, how many people here have a kitchen or bathroom that's at least 10 years old? And how many people here have lighting that just like came with the apartment? <laughs> okay. This is where I find you can make the most impact so inexpensively. Um, some of it's trial and error, some of it's research, but you know, again, especially if you own the home and you're not renting, some people aren't worried about losing a security deposit. I've often never seen a security <laughs> deposit back in my previous rentals. Um, you know, again, we don't all have the time and the budget to do a full renovation, and sometimes we want to learn some of the tricks of the trade on something smaller so you can make those mistakes. And I think one of the most important things is be prepared to make mistakes and embrace them because that's how you're going to figure out for the next one what is a priority and what is sort of like nice if one day we get there. So kitchens and bathrooms, um, just repainting old kitchen cabinets. I've done everything from those really awful like sort of uh, like they're almost like tobacco color. Ones. Yeah, with yeah. removable wallpaper, sand them down, a high glossy paint. Styx primer is an amazing primer for things that will adhere. Um, those are also those old Formica um, countertops that a lot of people have in their kitchen. You sand that down, you cover it with chalkboard paint, and you do co two coats of poly over it, and it looks like a black slate countertop. Like those are things and hardware, um, and it's great because you could go, you know, from a place like Rejuvenation and spend twenty-eight dollars on a door pull, <laughs> or you could take that same door pull, go to Home Depot two blocks over, and find a replica of that for three ninety-nine. And again, sometimes um, on something inexpensive, it's nice to splurge. Like I find in old rental apartments, I've always changed out the shower head and gotten like a really nice, because it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You start your day with it. It's one of those things that just like, it feels really good. Whereas again, if you don't use the kitchen that much or you're not gonna know the difference between a $28 door pull and a $3 door pull, the same thing with old doorknobs. If you have hollow doors in your apartment, you don't need to go and spend $125 on a beautiful doorknob. But for $9.99, you can get <laughs> like an oil rub bronze doorknob that, you know, those tactile things that you touch have a huge impact. And those are the things for people who are trying to update their home and maybe get to these big grand scale projects you start with those small things and that's where you start to make your mistakes and realize like, oh, I didn't measure out enough. I don't have enough product. Um, 
I didn't measure the circumference of the ceiling fixture and you know the old mark is showing. Like that's something now moving forward I need to be very, very conscious of. Working with your existing pieces and trying to freshen up is I think one of the best ways to get to the big picture of a gut renovation right. or renovating a larger apartment. Right, exactly. There's these challenges that you'll then be prepared for. Um, and one tip is, you know, shop high and then buy low. You know, you can look where what the high-end uh, brands might be or offering, you know, and what are the trends, and then you can find those things probably less expensive, like at a Home Depot, Ikea. on Ikea, eBay, like for example, like cabinet hardware, stuff like that. It's out there, so just, you know, look to the higher end brands and then you can translate that into your own house. That's awesome. Um, one design challenge that nearly everyone in New York has is small space living. Um, and Natasha has made a name for herself with a studio apartment she had um, that was quite small. Yeah. So would love to talk a little bit about, I think this is relevant to everybody. I live in a brownstone, but my three children share a bedroom smaller than this stage. What are some of the tricks that New Yorkers can use when they're thinking about um, planning for small spaces, making these small spaces look beautiful, and having them be very useful with some storage involved as well. Sure. I think the first and foremost, before you even get to the design, you need to think about the functionality of your small space. Think about the storage. I mean, when I tell people, I want you to list out everything that you're storing because if you have some, like if you have a KitchenAid mixer, you know, where are you going to put that? You need to make a list and then you figure out your storage around that. Um, always use your vertical space. Build upwards. I mean, it might be expensive to do a custom built-in, but what it's going to save you in the long run to be able to, you know, just put extra stuff that you have in there and hide away shoes somewhere. Um, so always go upwards. Use your wall space. Um, and then beyond the functionality and the design of the space, what I would suggest is Try to create focal points, um, either by making accent walls, painting a dark color in a small space. A lot of people think that's uh, a mistake. They think that's going to make walls close in on them, when in the actuality, if you paint every single wall white, it's going to feel like there's no contrast, there is no depth. Um, so yeah, use dark colors um, sparingly, but in accents, and try to create almost rooms within a room. For example, in our apartment, we had like a bar in the bookcase, you know? It was Tell like, everyone you know, how many was, square feet. It was 350 square feet, um, two cats, and a six foot five man. So, you know, it, Natasha. It, 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 was, it was a little bit tight. We had double duty <laughs> furniture. Um, I searched eBay forever to find this table that transformed. It was a coffee table and you pulled a lever and then magically it opened and then I could have a dinner party for six, which never happened. <laughs> um, but it was great and it, it also, when we went to sell the place, it was just these little touches and unique bits and you know, add layers, don't be scared. You know, when a buyer comes in, they're gonna not just want something that everybody else has. You know, we searched for, I, I added like a vintage mantle in there that I like seriously cried when we left. I was like, can I take it with me? And then we're like, no, you can't have this. Um, but, you know, it's adding texture, it's adding different colors, you know, different shapes. You know, sometimes people put like all the same shape somewhere. Like you're like, everything's a rectangle now. And you know you want to you want to make visual interest in any home that you design and make it functional for the next person for yourself. Uh, and you know there's no point in renovating if you, then you're like uh, there's stuff Thank everywhere. <laughs> awesome. Um, and the I think and a really thing, important thing that I wanted to talk about was. When people are starting to think about renovating and the design elements of them, where should they lean into what they want and where should they think about what's going to sell? Um, because of course, like I think we all want to renovate and make a home that we can sell for a lot of money down the road, but we also want to be happy living there. And what are some kind of trade-offs that people should think about from trends to um, color to pattern to customization that would love to hear about your recommendation on. Yeah, so 
again, as a real estate agent, a lot of the work that I do from the design is taken from years of walking through homes with buyers and getting those whispers in your ear of every single thing that's wrong with it. Um, and that's sort of how I figure out how to shape a space. Um, but that's where a lot of it comes from, is everyone, you know, people will fixate on an oddly colored couch or a wall, all the things that look can change or don't even come with the apartment. Um, you know, especially now we live in this very visually driven, like Instagram, swipe right, swipe left. And it, it's fascinating. There are times where I sit with clients and buyers and I'm like, I would like to watch you look at listings. Mm -hmm. And they're like, that's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, 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 you'll, you'll understand in a second. And so, and it's really interesting. I ask them to verbalize what they're thinking and it helps us to just sort of understand each other and I know what their process is and I understand what's important to them. And it's fascinating how many people will pass through something that to me is like a sign that says opportunity. <laughs> like this is a value, you must come here. And they're like, the couch is awful, next. And they swipe past it and it's, you're like, no, 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 the price is square <laughs> foot. Like that's what's actually important. The couch doesn't come with the apartment. Um, so when I'm starting one of my design projects and I'm working with people who are often improving their apartment, the functionality and the things that add value, the things that make it unique and special, um, even if it's like those unloved post-war apartments like adding crown molding or advising, um, the difference of sometimes, again, when you're looking at overall costs, is there, is there a budget to replace those parquet floors? Like no one's ever said, oh, you know what I would love? Like engineered parquet from the 1980s. <laughs> like, oh, you know, no one ever wants that. So. <laughs> You know, can you get around that with staining them in a walnut finish and then using a lot of rugs to sort of like mitigate that concern of like, oh, I have to renovate the floors? Or do you just say, forget about everything else and let's redo the floors? Mm -hmm. um, no one ever has enough storage space, no matter how much money they have. When you talk with and meet with people in seven, 10, $12 million homes, it's still the same issues and things where you're talking about like entry level four and five hundred thousand dollar studios. Um, to me, adding functionality like a closet system, and you can go high end like California closets. You can go end like Alpha and IKEA. Those are the things where again, when you're sort of weighing this out, like what makes an apartment functional, what makes it better, what makes it more interesting. That's what I sort of veer mm -hmm. towards. And so um, something like color applied to an expensive project like kitchen and bath? Like, are we in a world where everyone just wants white subway tile and white cabinets? Can people venture beyond black that? Too. You can have black. black. Okay, black too. On the floor. Red, Not on the walls. yeah, okay. <laughs> black forest, white, white subway tile walls. Like, can we, what can we do? So, here's the thing. I think if you're not experienced and you have no idea what you're doing and you're not that into design, do not take a risk. <laughs> it will not pay off. Like, do not get red cabinets, do not get purple cabinets, do not get a mint green smeg fridge. Like, if you don't know how to pull it together and you don't have a designer who's pulling it together, you are like, Imagine yourself yeah, taking fail. money and flushing it down a, like a Giant. Japanese toilet that talks to you, right? Like, you're not getting your money back. Now, if you've hired someone that their work is published um, and they are incredibly capable and they have a reputation, they may be able to do it. Now, where you can sort of dial all that back are the accents, mm -hmm. the the KitchenAid mixer. Like that's, if you love candy, red or pink or whatever Hi, it is, get the $300 mixer. <laughs> do not do pink cabinets. Like no. someone will, most everyone will want to rip them out. And again, it's, you toe the line. Like I, again, I've painted my own kitchen cabinets, Benjamin Moore Adriatic Sea. It's like a vibrant blue. I love that stuff, but I'm confident that what I can create, I can easily cost effectively change or I absolutely know without a doubt that someone will pay for my taste. Um, but that takes years of refining, testing it out, and making mistakes in other people's apartments a long time ago. Um, <laughs> so can I just add, I, I keep forgetting that we have slides up. We are showing some of these slides to show the image on the left is perhaps a lot for someone who would be looking at buying it. The image on the right is something that 
like, that's one of mine the yeah, right the, and that is one of my like many crazy couches that has paid off in spades it adds the right amount of right. color interest makes it unique makes it stand out but i but only put everything else is neutral and toned down but i will only put that crazy blue couch in a specific style of apartment in a specific price range that speaks to specific people while being sort of like crazy and mud cloth and this vibrant print like if you put that in the wrong apartment that caters to a different demographic you have sort of like you've negated its value or you will get people who will fixate on that crazy indigo blue mud cloth sofa that they cannot get over and they will not come to your apartment mm -hmm. but if you do it in the right space um, and again, that takes practice. And so maybe you don't want to spend $2,000 on a couch, but spend 20 bucks on a pillow, right? Like that's an easy way. Like it doesn't work. You return it or you take it off and put on something gray well, that it's like, it works. And the, the, we don't know whose photo this is in the sorry, left. I hope it's sorry. no one in the room. Um, so maybe I love stripes. Maybe stripes aren't best for the rug and the two sofas in the room but perhaps you could find something like a pillow to incorporate straight. Absolutely. I think it, when we talked about this before, it's about the things that you can move, like artwork. You can get really personalized in the artwork that you choose and maybe a rug that you choose, but you know, you don't want something that's too overpowering like stripes on stripes on stripes in that photo. So, uh, yeah, and then I think we were talking about paint too, you yeah. know. Paint an accent wall, it's not a big deal. Somebody hopefully can look past it. Um, you know, you can get a little bit more daring with your paint color choices. Um, I think once it comes time to sell, you have to reevaluate if it needs to be painted, if it's taking away from your listing, but that's not a big deal. Painting is easy. I have painted one million things. You know, you, it's you, something you can do in a day. Um, it, it's, you can figure out how to do it. It's not that hard. You don't have to hire a professional to paint an accent wall for you. Yep. And so in terms of like building customized items for your space, so maybe you have three children that share a bedroom and you want to build a really customized um, permanent setup, w what are your thoughts for customizing for yourself and knowing you need to live there versus um, thinking about future buyers? So in that scenario, and by the way, so what Amory's leaving out is she renovated this brownstone with three children, which is just like everyone should be clapping for that <laughs> alone. Um, I, I like I, I honestly I was telling her like our dryer broke. I have a two and a half year old, and it was like it was scary. So I do not know how you rent an entire brownstone with three kids. It's really incredible. Um, you know, on that note, if you have three children and they're sharing a room build whatever the fuck you need to build to make sure that they're like, <laughs> they're comfortable, they're having fun, and you're saving money. There are certain scenarios, um, and I've been in this many times where I'm helping someone redo their apartment in Brooklyn who have decided to leave Brooklyn and move to Westchester, um, and they have two cribs or two beds in a room, and it's come up where other people have suggested maybe that they lose a better crib. like anyone who has children, like, you cannot lose a crib, right? Like, <laughs> the child needs somewhere to sleep. There are certain things that have to happen for you, for your sanity, that that stuff can come out. And there are tricks and ways to work around scenarios like that, whether it's a virtual rendering of a room or when the time comes, figuring out what to disassemble or making something else so compelling in the apartment that it's not even an issue. And again, from a, a real estate agent perspective, I typically find that if in that specific scenario of three children in one room, there's most likely a 90% chance that the buyer coming to that apartment will have a child or two children. And you don't have to worry because they understand the situation. Um, there are some neighborhoods where there is a disconnect of the new buyers coming in and the people trying to leave it, and it, it doesn't make sense. Um, but again, it, especially when you're talking Brownstone, Brooklyn, you got a contraption for three kids. Like, there's no way around it. Where, you know, the, the talk of customization and doing anything like really crazy, my rule of thumb is if you can pick it up with two hands and put it somewhere else in the apartment, like, go for it. That's customize whatever you want, put up the craziest piece of art you could find. If you cannot physically remove it or it costs more than you know a few hundred dollars to change it, like repainting a foyer or an accent wall, that's where 
you should start to say, do I absolutely need to do this if you're thinking I'm gonna be selling in the next five years? And what I find is, while most people don't sell in five years or need to sell, everyone in New York is so fixated on the resale of their apartment and everyone acts as sort of like, I just bought this, I'm doing this renovation, and then I'm selling it in <laughs> like a year. Like it usually does not work out like that, but you should be conscious of the decisions you make now to increase your return on investment later on. That's great, that's awesome. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to ask about is trends. I think I, I'm on Pinterest, I'm on Instagram, I get very excited about trends and they seem new and exciting and they probably would be great for my new home because it's all new and then I finish that home and it's a year later and it's not cool anymore. Like how do people kind of think about how do I integrate that cleat tile or that leopard print moment into a home but not have it be stale down the road? Um, I think you just really need to look at the trend, think about the trend and then interpret it. So for example, um, on the screen, I had mentioned I've been seeing a lot of contrast molding being painted, and I really like that look, and I don't think that's something, I think it is somewhat trendy, it's also somewhat classical. Um, I don't think that's something that people are gonna be scared of, um, especially if it's like a light gray or a tonal gray that's offset instead of just pure white. Uh, however, uh, things like those um, patterned Moroccan tiles, I think, They've been around for some time, and I think they're, they're, they're stale already. And I don't know, I, I, that's something that I wouldn't necessarily put into an apartment that you're only going to be living in for a few years. So let's say, OK, you like that Moroccan look, get a Moroccan pillow, Moroccan blanket, or whatever it is, some decor. You don't need to really incorporate it into the stuff you can't move. Um, that's great. Um, you know, I think the thing about trends, what it, it's, I did an event um, at CB2 recently over the summer and there was this talk of like millennial pink. And I was like, well, like my mom's bathroom in the house <laughs> Long Island that I grew up in that hasn't been renovated since it was built in 1948 is millennial pink. Like trends aren't really trends. They just, they're things that keep came in, coming up and back. Like right now there's like, Rattan has a moment. It's like, Rattan's been around forever. Like, things become popular, they fall out of favor. Again, all of these things that are trends are also typically classic pieces that just over t periods of time become more accessible to people, especially now as production of things is a lot less expensive, it's easier to get items. Again, where do these pieces sort of fit in that can be easily changed? If you're drawn to bright, cheerful colors and heavy patterns, like, it's very easy to do that with fabric and duvet and bedding and things that can easily be changed. Whereas again, the, the cost to do the walls and things like that are very expensive. However, again, the same thing with the nuts and bolts of construction. If you've made the decision and you have the budget to hire an expert whose work you love, whose work you admire, and you want that bedroom with, you know, like a sort of like postmodern chin sort of vibe, and that's what you've always dreamed of, then just do it. Right, and like when the time comes if you need to resell the apartment, if it's not still current, if it gets negative feedback, then you typically have the luxury to change it if it's 10, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing you want, go for it if you hire the right team. Awesome, and then I'll ask the same question to you guys. What was the biggest mistake you ever made on a project? I'm glad you classified on a project. <laughs> like, oh, oh, my bar mitzvah. Um, <sighs> you know, it, it's interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm typically playing a role in so many people's lives and it's often their mistakes that you try everything you can to say like, let's take a step back. A nice I think reflection. every, no, it, it's, <laughs> Everyone in New York is in a hurry. Everybody wants everything done yesterday. And you know, I would say the one piece of advice I can give you from real estate design is just like, 
just take a breath for a minute and realize like the importance of all of this. And it's your home, right? We're not talking about how to purchase an investment property in Florida. We're talking <laughs> about the four walls and the roof over your head and your family, whatever it is, long-term growth, return, just like breathe a little bit and figure out what do I need, what don't I need. There are certain things, obviously, like the permit process, which is kind of a nightmare that you want to happen as quickly as possible, and it will not happen as quickly oh. as possible. But some of these other things, I find that we often make mistakes because we are obsessed with like having to get this done yesterday. And it doesn't work like that. You are not in control of the majority of things from the materials being delivered to not only just the DOB, but the co-op boards, the condo. Like, just because you're in a condo doesn't mean it's that much easier. Everything still has to be approved. People are still involved. There's still rules and regulations. Um, there are so many things that you have absolutely no control of, and if you rush through it, I think that's where a lot of mistakes happen and a lot of money is lost from just trying to rush. That's great. I'm gonna touch on, kind of build on that. Um, I've made a few mistakes, uh, so. <laughs> uh, no, really, what I think is, uh, when we first bought our house uh, that we live in now, we were definitely rushed by our contractors to make decisions. They were like, we're on a timeline, you gotta make decisions, we gotta do this. And I was like, we just bought the house. Like, I, you know, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what I want. Um, and I think I picked some materials that now looking back, I'm like, why did I put marble in the, like, in the bathroom? Moroccan tile. No, I didn't put Moroccan tile, exactly. Why did I put Moroccan tile everywhere? Oh uh, no, like, I put marble in uh, the bathroom that's upstairs, it's, it's a, it's two bathroom house, but the upstairs just has one bathroom, and I put marble tile in it, and like, I feel like I should have honestly just put subway tile in it. That was an mm -hmm. extra expense that I, you know, I really liked the look, and it still looks beautiful, but it was something that I could have saved, you know, $1,500 on, okay? Um, I over-customized a bathroom vanity, because I was like, this is what I want, and I couldn't find it, and then Ikea, like, three months later, has the exact bathroom vanity that I paid $3,500 for. And I'm like, you know, so those are the things that I think if you have other people rush you, um, you make mistakes. So before you really embark on everything, just make sure you have a clear plan and you've thought it through and, you know, build your Pinterest board and save all your Instagram stuff. Um, and do pricing beforehand. Like, don't, just don't say, I love marble tile, and then be like, oh, wait, it costs this much per square foot? Like, you know, you need to understand the materials that you're using, and um, don't be rushed, because that's where the mistakes are made. Awesome. Thank you guys so Thank much. You. Thank you. Are we, so we are going to invite everybody back up for questions. Questions for this talented crew. Yes. Um, I'm not 100% sure how to phrase this. Oh, sorry. I'm not 100% sure how to phrase this question because I've never dealt with it before. We are in the process of purchasing a condo, and you spoke a little, a little bit about um, going before condo board, which is very, you know, of course you have a vision. You want to do what you want to do. Where, in terms of, like, for example, want to renovate the kitchen, um, where is the place that you might get the most pushback from when you're submitting plans? And about how, and what about if you're, um, you submitted plans, they approved, and then you decided to change the <laughs> midstream of the construction? Uh, changing wet over dry areas? And changing yep. gas lines is where you're going to have the most sort of resistance, pushback, or it's going to cost the most. Um, you know, again, we live in a vertical city, so if you're trying to put a wet area where no one else in that line um, has a wet area, that will most likely not be approved. Um, so sometimes you are, with condominiums and co-ops, you are limited and confined um, to specific areas of the apartment. Um, but again, the same process in, in theory, like with the DOB and with those filings, 
all that and the alteration agreement is happening with the building as and, well. And so just to add, on, the, like, on any scale with permits, whether it's a condo board, approvals, any of those things, the pushback is always the things that could affect other people. So um, structural is huge. If you take down a load-bearing wall and you live in a brownstone, that can affect everybody on the block because all the houses are attached. Gas is the biggest thing that the DOB gets caught up on and then boards do as well. And so uh, one tip I have is it's frustrating when the work that you're doing and the money you're spending isn't approved. Sometimes it's helpful to take a step back and be like, there's probably a reason why. Like, we live in this crammed in city where every decision that I make is going to affect everybody around me. Um, so that's, that wasn't exactly your question, but I just wanted to add that in for everyone as well. Oh my goodness. Um, if you're going to be doing a renovation and you can't be present as often as you would like. Um, I know that there are, um, uh, there are people <laughs> or vendors who can assist with that. And I'm having trouble figuring out that how many consultants and helpers and yep. so forth do you need to. I know there are project managers and construction managers and consultants and owner's reps. And can you help me sort out who's really needed uh, yep. in terms of making sure that plans are followed and mi mistakes are minimized. Yeah, for sure. So there's a lot of different people that can take that role. So there, there are project managers and construction managers. Sometimes the architect can take that role. Some, they, they will offer project managing services as well. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need them all. You just need one of them. An, an interior designer could even potentially take the role of coordinating the team. So it, it is nice to have someone that can coordinate everything and be on site for you. Uh, like we talked about earlier, you know, if it's not you walking in to inspect the general contractor's work, it could be that person. It could be the project manager or, or the architect, if the architect is doing that for you. So um, I, I would say, you know, you need one of them. You don't need them all. It doesn't really, like, it, it, they're all going to provide a similar service. If you go with, a, with someone who's a project manager, they're probably more of a dedicated individual that is going to do that, as opposed to an architect who probably won't be as available as someone who's just dedicated to it. So um, there's also design build companies that sort of do all of it too that also would provide a, a project manager. Um, so there's, they're all different ways of kind of getting to the same, the same answer is that you're going to have that one individual or that one company or whatever that's going to take the role of that, that project manager. So that's, we, we actually started project managing um, just because there were so many people out there who had questions like you and like everyone else about how to get the team together and how to get someone on site. Um, and so it's, for, for us it's fun because we love the process. Um, but I would say project manager, construction manager, talk to your architect, or a design build firm. They'll all provide that service. You just need one of them. You don't need yeah. them all. And it is important um, as you're looking at contractors to understand the full sub scope of services that they're going to provide. Um, some contractors don't order the materials or pay for the materials themselves. Um, and that goes on to the homeowner. If you have a full-time job, that's a lot. Um, that would be a much larger scope for a project manager. Some contractors will do everything for you. If they do everything for you, they mark it up. Um, and they're usually very transparent about that. It's extra work for them. But when you're getting um, contractor bids in, it's important to make sure they outline for you what their full scope of services and responsibilities are going to be so you can compare them and then build out the additional services you need around that. Uh, first, first, a big thanks to everyone on the panel for coming out. Uh, my question is for Barry and Jordan. Uh, you talk about putting together a team, and yeah, I can barely see it. Um, you talk about putting together the team, and you meet a lot of characters uh, throughout the process. What are some of the red flags that you look for in order to uh, sort those people out? So I think probably the, the main one is communication. Um, 
and not only the way they communicate and explain things, but also how often you hear from them. If, if you're, when you're in the vetting process, if you're having trouble with that person getting back to you, not getting stuff on time, it is not going to get better <laughs> once you start working with them. It's actually gonna get much worse because they should be putting their best face forward during that vetting process. So um, I think that's, that's a really big one. Uh, and I think that's probably the biggest complaint or horror stories you hear about people with general contractors and any service provider, it's usually that they don't show up, they can't get in touch with them, they, they maybe the they're totally dark, like, you know, that's usually the complaint you hear. So I'd say communication is really big and, and there's some really simple things you can do during that vetting process to try and get a feel for their communication. I would have a list of questions put together that you ask every person that you, you interview and ask them the same questions, get a feel for how they answer them, if they try to get around the question a little bit, you know, if they're very direct in their answer. And that's what I would look for is a very direct answer, um, a, a, a great explanation of not just the specific thing, but other things that, uh, you know, that it comes into play and, and affects it. Um, and just how often they're communicating with you. So make sure the skill set is aligned. I think that's really great too. So if you're looking for someone who, you know, let's say if you're a general contractor and you need some, you have a lot of mill work that you want to do in your place, you may want to make sure they have that skill set before you move forward because not all of them do. If you're doing a restoration project like we're used to or uh, not, or not, you know, you want to make sure that they have that specific skill set and it's something that they, you know, maybe you're even passionate about, you know, mm -hmm. they, they like going through the process of, of restoring a, a project. Um, so those are, I think, some of the yeah. highlights for me. And I think one thing that we talk about a lot at StreetEasy um, in selecting an agent, which is similar to this process, is make sure you like them. Like, you are going to spend yeah. so much time with every one of these types of people that you hire, including your lender. Like, you're going to talk to them all the time. You're going to text them. You're going to see them. You're going to see them in your pajamas. You're gonna, like, <laughs> they're going to see your kids. They're going to see your kids without diapers on. Like, th they become part of your life. And make sure you're on board with that person being part of your life because it's got to be fun. Like, it's stressful and it's expensive and there are permits and all these things. But at the end of the day, like, you can't be too serious about it. And so if the partners you choose are people you really love to spend time with and you can laugh a bit, it's going to make the whole experience so much better. Very true. Hi. Um, how much should we estimate the price per square foot for a gut renovation? Oof. Oof. That's a that's a really good question. Um, Ad, I'm yeah. it, it just, gonna it give it depends. to Adam. <laughs> it depends Numbers on count. level of finish. You could spend two hundred dollars per square, which is kind of like the industry standard for a kind of contractor, general sort of. contractor grade reno, and it can go all the way up. You know, it depends on how much you want to spend. But it it is finish. possible um, to renovate a, a pretty nicely with medium to even lower uh, priced finishes as well. So that, I think that's probably a good starting point though. Yeah, is $200 I would agree. Worth. And you know, it's, it depends. Are you moving walls? Are you moving plumbing? Yeah. It's like, you know, you involve gas, you involve plumbing, you got, involve electric. You know, that's a lot of trades right there that cost a lot of money that you don't really see. Mm -hmm. um, if everything stays put and you're surface treating everything, mm -hmm. you're going to spend significantly less money. It just really depends on your scope, and it's hard. I, I, you know, it's a, it's, I want to say it's a loaded question, but at times it's like people want to know, like, I need to know exactly how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. And it's, until you have everything defined, it's, it's an impossible question to answer, unfortunately. And, and I, you, you, sorry, you do need to add on um, the carry costs, so how much you're spending on the mortgage on that home if you're living in a different home, and the cost, any cost you have associated with living. Insurance? So, sure. So just that's, I think sometimes people are like, oh, my renovation was $100,000, but then you also rented for $5,000 a month for five months, so that your renovation costs more than $100,000. True. And I think that it, it also sort of goes back to selecting the right GC and the right architect. Do they run through those options, right? Like you, again, this person is going to be in your home. They become a member of the family for a period of time. Are they offering you options that save you money? Are they explaining where here's a good place to cut costs and here's a place to spend it from the return on investment, functionality, um, the durability of a product? Again, it, like IKEA kitchen cabinets are phenomenal cabinets and you can use Reform 
to do stunning, incredibly modern, rich looking faces that save a lot of money. When you have people that talk to you like that and say, tell me how you live in the space. How do you function in it? What's important? Do you, again, like, I think a kitchen's an easy way, especially from the brokerage side. I, I was in a place today where, like, you could microwave, a, a, um, like, a hungry man dinner in the stove or, or cook, like, a little teeny tiny plate of food. Like, you can't have Thanksgiving dinner. So if you're working with someone that's selecting those materials for you and you have a family of four and you like to cook, if they put in a teeny tiny little stove, they're not understand, or oven rather, they're not understanding who you are. And that's, again, are people gonna ask those questions? How do you function in the space? What do you need? I think that goes back to the renovation and then also selecting the right person for you. Where is the mic? Hi. Um, Hi. Do you suggest still getting the permit expediter if you know you have two gut renovations in your building ahead of you? Like, so you know you're not gonna be able to start construction, let's say for five months at least. So, um, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. So permits only last for a certain period of time. I believe it's 12 months, but I might be mistaken. So you don't wanna get so far, you're not, you shouldn't be like, oh, I'm gonna renovate at some point in the next decade, let me just get that permit now. It will, it will run out, you can renew it, which isn't so hard. Um, but you don't know how long it's going to take to get the permit. Um, in my, the four times I've pulled permits, it's taken four plus months each time. That's for varying scopes of job. Um, so I would say if you know you're going to renovate in the next year, go ahead and start working on the permit. If you have no idea when you're going to do it, you can push it up. Expediters are not expensive. I, I would highly recommend an expediter. Yep, yep. Go ahead. So, I was based on your timeline. Would you recommend finding a general contractor before you finalize like your design plan and get it permitted and approved? Uh, you, one of the things you'll want to do when you're going through the process of the design and before you do the approval is you probably want to understand the costs involved in the job that you're going to do. Um, so I would recommend, yeah, at least getting quotes, at least mm -hmm. getting an understanding of who you might want to work with, because um, before you file with the, your, with the DOB and get your plans approved, you want to make sure that what you're doing is, is in your budget. So yeah, I, I think it's a good idea to get the, the general contractor ready. You also want them to be ready when those permits are pulled yeah. to s literally start demo like the day they have the permits in their hand. Um, so I would recommend having your team set up and you know, it, it, you know, once you get to the point where you actually have the expediter go to the DOB, um, hopefully at that point, you know, you're, you should be ready. You should be yeah. ready to get that approval and have the contractor ready yeah. to go. In terms of the GC versus the architect though, um, the GC cannot give you a quote unless they have full plans. So I have at times been like, no, the cabinets are here and the, the sink is here and I, it's blue, like, I don't know. Um, and the GC's like, yeah, come back to me when you have drawn up plans right. because I can't, word. yeah, I can't give you any sort of estimate until I have those specific plans in place. Um, particularly because uh, a GC always has to know if plumbing or gas are being moved because that's a, that is a huge, makes a huge difference in pricing. Important with GCs, I also like to ask how many jobs they're working on at the time. Yeah. Because if they have too many jobs, you're not going to see the GC. You may see his project manager and you'll be chasing them down. You know, I highly recommend going to see other jobs they have going on at the same time and ask those owners, like, how's the relationship doing? They may or may not want to give up that information, but if they're not happy, they're probably going to tell you. <laughs> so it's yeah. a good reason to to check the references, not just get the references, but check them. Call them. And check in, you know, later on as well. You know, some things look great now, and then six months, a year down the road, they have problems. So you'll find out after the winter and after the summer, because <laughs> things expand and contract, and they don't look the same thing you know, after a while. <laughs> it's also a good idea to have the person ready, because the, this is a really busy time for contractors. So 
um, if, you, if you don't have someone ready to go, it could be tough to find someone, or if you don't have that person kind of locked down, uh, th they could get busy with other jobs. Another well. yeah. job, yeah. 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 Yeah, I want to talk about budget, okay? Uh, like, for instance, whether you renovate a kitchen or a bathroom or a whole house, I mean, does it always the budget? I, I, I do some renovation, but I notice, let's say if 50,000, it always end up 70. I mean, are you guys always on budget or what's the realistic? <laughs> let's say, oh, we bought a house, we want to spend 50,000 renovating. But the truth is, how many percentage we should add on to that to have yeah. a well, realistic? You, you add that. <laughs> you, uh, I think it's a good rule of thumb to add on anywhere from 10 to 20%. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most people make a budget. And they don't. Like, <laughs> I want kind of this. this. <laughs> yeah, like that, that's. $50,000. That's based on and nothing. <laughs> if you've been through it 10 times, then you know this costs this, this costs that. I'm going to factor in the expediter. I'm going to factor in. My carrying costs, I'm gonna factor in the mortgage payment while I'm not living there, I'm gonna factor in the, the rental apartment that I have to have while my house is being done. But if you're just saying I wanna spend $50,000, like you're probably gonna end up spending $70,000, $75,000. That's the reality of the business and the reality of not researching it and the reality of just, you know, things change, things aren't ordered properly, sometimes by you, sometimes by the contractor. And again, things cost a lot more money and most people, I find, make changes along the way that cost them a lot more money. Now, change, change orders, orders, thank you. Very word of the business. Which, so one of the pieces of advice I have, if you have the luxury to live in something before you renovate it, do it. If some people buy something, I've had several sales recently where the residence is not inhabitable. Like a human being cannot live in it. Like don't try and live there. If you have the ability to live in something that you've just bought and it needs to be renovated, live there. Have it cleaned within an inch of its life, right? So you just like feel somewhat good about it. Figure out what works, what doesn't work, because that's the difference of adding 10% for changes to 20 to 25%, because you understand, I need this, I don't need that, the apartment doesn't get good light, the air circulation needs to, like through all of these modifications, so if you have the ability, if you're buying something, to live in it, do it to save money. Again, everyone's in a rush to get something done, but that's one of those things where if you step back and realize I need to function in this space to figure out where to put my money, you will probably come out ahead. Mm -hmm. How about how much money should you give to the contractor up front? Let's say they're doing a $15,000 debt hmm. and they need to get wood. Do you give them a credit card? <laughs> It probably depends on no, how big the project that. is, but <laughs> yeah. it, I, I, it, depend, it depends on the size of the project. I've seen 10%, yeah, 10% yeah, I feel but, like um, is, yeah. is average, but. I think this is. Well, I think it, you said deck and you said wood in the same sentence. So if you know anything about decks in New York City, you have non-combustible <laughs> material within three feet of the property line. So you should have a, a steel superstructure and with a, a Yeah, you'll get a violation. You'll get a that. violation for that. Uh, so you know. I can give you the name of a couple of good deck guys if you like, so, honestly. In Long Island. In Long Island? Oh, yeah. Well basically that. as a mortgage lender, uh, I would say you can pick ten decks in Long Island and I'll bet you nine of them have no permits on it. But that's just my personal opinion. It depends on what county you're in. Uh, there's a constant battle in Long Island. <laughs> if you're buying a house, to make sure that deck is on the survey because there's a very good chance it's unpermitted deck. <laughs> and you may have trouble with your lender on that. But Going back to personal. money though. Back to money. Uh, you said a smaller scale job, they may require more money up front. You think about it, if it's a fifteen thousand dollar job, ten percent is not really gonna give them a lot to start on. A larger scale job, the percentage probably drops down. Yeah. So I would never pay more than 30% upfront, in my personal opinion. I think, so you should always ask your contractor to break down um, their fees for their work versus materials, because they may need all those materials up front, which isn't you paying them that's paying yeah, for the steel or the we, wood. We find out who is the person supplying the wood. Oh, good for you. We pay those wood. Yeah. 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 Right, the markup. Great, yeah, we have some folks in the middle. Hey guys, uh, so 
question is a little bit uh, outside of the box. I'm considering a gut renovation project with three partners. I think there's a lot of uh, upside in partnering with others. I think I've identified some downsides. I'm curious, everyone has their own perspective. If you've seen partnerships, where are the typical sticking points? Uh, generally, have you seen them work out well, not well? And what are your general thoughts on partnering uh, as opposed to just doing a project solo? I, well, I, are you partnering to buy a property as an investment? Or are you partnering and you're going to do the work? So I, it really depends on what you're doing here. I honestly think it's all about clearly defined scope of work. Who's doing what? Who's responsible for what? And holding everybody accountable for it. You know, there's a lot of old adage you talk about assumptions. You're making an asset of you and me when you do that, and it usually comes forward. It's either somebody will end up feeling that they're doing too much work mm -hmm. and have resentment towards the others. I think it's very important just to put, you know, put down in writing yeah. who does what, what their responsibility is. And there are times where certain job tasks require more time and effort, and that person may, in the industry we call it a promote, they may get a little bit extra, yeah. you know, percentage of the profit because they're putting in more time than somebody else. So you, you really have to kind of have sit down, put it in writing, and basically sign an agreement. Exactly. I, would, I agree. Yeah. And if you're forming an LLC, so to speak, you're going to have to put that in your operating agreement anyway and how, who's putting in how much money, how are the profits are being split, and what happens if something goes wrong. Yeah. I think just putting it all down on, on paper and holding everybody accountable for it is the best way to yeah. handle that. It's also safe to say you will not speak to at least one of those three other people ever again. <laughs> um, and that will happen to everyone in the group. I th if, again, you clearly define things. Um, is it a four family that each person would occupy or is it just strict investment? And Legal agreement in writing, and I think, again, the people that I would, I know this might sound really silly, I would figure out an activity that the four of you can do that is some sort of, like, to, to understand and see, like, not some, Built like, some survivor. Furniture. Yeah, like, <laughs> do some, like, survivor-esque, like, <laughs> what's the one where they get in a Escape car and go road. places? Oh. Like, yeah. <laughs> figure out something where the yeah. four of you are, are tested a little bit, and how do you respond and react and work together? I mean. I think you might get some clues like that you may not get from just casually knowing people, um, but clearly defining those roles and responsibilities and financial obligations. Um, but just understand like there's a good chance someone's not going to talk yeah. to somebody. And I'll, I'm going to add one small, very specific thing. Make sure you have really organized bookkeeping and accounting. When you're doing a project by yourself, you can like run to Home Depot, like I do every weekend or whatever it is, and kind of lose the receipt, and it's fine. If you have multiple people putting money in and eventually taking money out, you need to make sure you have somebody who's going to do all the bookkeeping and be very organized with it. Create your own checking account just for your job. If you're even yeah, your homeowner, sure. create a, a third checking account just for that job and only use that account. Even get a separate credit card just for that job. So it, you, at least you're not mingling money together and it gets confusing and then you try to go back three months from now and piece it all together. It's, it's very difficult and extremely frustrating. This gentleman in the middle has had his hand up every single time. Go ahead. Back to these are waiting. Yeah, these, oh. these guys. Okay, last question. Oh, wait. Oh. Yeah. We'll be around after. Thank you all for your great insights and thanks for hosting. A uh, question I have is taking everything that you've said so far, adding the element of renovating for a disabled person. Uh, I want to do a renovation for my mom who just was diagnosed with Parkinson and I want to make sure when I walk into it from a ADH or from a, um, something that's going to be resellable perhaps in the future that's also uh, able for her to live comfortably as a disabled individual. Any thoughts or things I should be keeping in mind? So many of um, the DOB rules at this point in time are for ADA compliance and so um, I actually think that if you build a property that's accommodating to her it's going to end up being 
the way that the city is going to want the project down the road. Um, I think that in a case like this, like you are doing something for family and it's very important and so you should focus first on the property, the function, your family, your mother, and making it right for you and worry less about what's happening down the road. That said, maybe don't do like leopard print on the widened hallways. Maybe pause on that. Make sure you can pick it up and lock it up. Um, but seriously, I, we a number our most recent project. There were a number of things we had to do to make the brownstone ADA compliant, which was a challenge with a hundred-year-old house. But um, you're probably going to be on the right track from a permitting and DOB standpoint by doing that. No. Oh. Okay. All right. We need to wrap up questions. Um, we will all stick around for a little bit because I know there are a few more questions lingering. Happy to chat with you guys. Uh, oh. Let's, let's wrap up and come chat with you in a second because it's a very specific question. Thank you guys, everybody, for coming very, for coming. very much. Thank we you. appreciate it. Reach out with more questions as well.